Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless genesis 12 1 through 3 now the lord had said to abram get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that i will show you i will make you a great nation i will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing i will bless those who bless you and i will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. The world is in real danger of being cursed by God. After 11 months of fighting between Israel and Hezbollah, the United States is leading a group of European and Arab nations calling for a 21-day ceasefire. The proposal comes after an intense bombing campaign by Israel that significantly damaged the Iranian-backed terror group. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. President Joe Biden told reporters the call for a ceasefire is backed by several nations. We've been able to generate significant support in Europe as well as the Arab nations who poured this war, war not wide. The statement by the U.S., France, and others calls for the implementation of a U.N. resolution established after the 2006 Lebanon war, but does not mention Hezbollah. The resolution forbids the presence of any militias in southern Lebanon. Some reports indicated Israel accepted the ceasefire, but Prime Minister Netanyahu's office issued a statement and said, this is an American-French proposal that the Prime Minister has not even responded to. The report about the purported directive to ease up on the fighting in the North is the opposite of the truth. The Prime Minister has directed the IDF to continue fighting with full force. Before leaving for the U.S. to address the U.N. General Assembly on Friday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu emphasize why Israel is fighting this war. We're determined to return our residents in the north safely to their homes. We're inflicting blows on Hezbollah that they did not imagine. We do it with power. We do it with ruse. I promise you one thing. We will not rest until they return home. Since October 8th, Hezbollah has fired more than 9,000 rockets, missiles, drones, and UAVs into Israel. This is the reality of Hezbollah's threat in Israel. If this was a home, the entire family would have been killed, which is why Israel is at war, until these people can come back home. There's no evidence that Hezbollah has been willingly leaving the border with Israel. Hezbollah's entire raison d'etre is to invade and attack Israel. While diplomats work for a ceasefire, Israel appears on the verge of a ground invasion. The IDF moved more tanks to the border and called up two brigades of reservists. IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Herzi Halevi told troops they may soon cross into Lebanon. The goal is very clear, to safely return the residents of the north. To achieve that, we are preparing the process of maneuvering, which means your military boots, your maneuvering boots, will enter enemy territory. Meanwhile, two top Senate Republicans are accusing the Biden administration of holding up weapons and other aid to Israel. A letter from Senator Tom Cotton and Senator Minority Leader Mitch McConnell states, we write to strongly condemn your administration's continued delay in providing critical military equipment and weapons to our ally Israel in the midst of an existential war. The weapons include Apache attack helicopters and MK-84 bombs, which can destroy Hezbollah and Hamas assets in deeply buried tunnels. In the last days, Jerusalem will be the focal point of world politics as we read in Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. I have often wondered what could possibly cause America to turn on Israel. I believe the answer is now clear. Biden and Harris have undermined Israel every step of the way. 
They talk out of both sides of their mouths, saying Israel has a right to defend themselves, while at the same time telling Israel to de-escalate. This is no way for an ally to act. The United States should be standing alongside Israel instead of appeasing their enemies. Israel's enemies are an existential threat, and by the way, the enemies of Israel are also the enemies of the U.S. If Israel's enemies would just put down their weapons of war, there would be peace. The sad thing is, if Israel puts down their weapons, there will be no more Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye, and the world, including America, will be judged for its actions regarding Israel. The prophet Zechariah tells us how the Lord will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, as we read in Zechariah 14.12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Israel continues taking fire from several fronts. Take a look. The port city of Elat got hit by a drone attack overnight. The Islamic resistance in Iraq took credit for it, and two Israelis have minor injuries as a result of that attack. Meanwhile, so far this morning, according to the IDF, Hezbollah has fired into northern Israel approximately 45 times. We're also learning the small contingent of American troops now headed to the region will be deployed to Cyprus, an island country in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, to support the 40,000 American troops already in the region. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Zelensky's in the U.S. for the U.N. General Assembly, and he took a detour to Joe Biden's hometown of Scranton, where he was escorted by Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro on a visit to an ammunition factory. Governor Shapiro, a Harris surrogate, signs artillery shells that will presumably be used to kill Russians. Now, clearly, this will be seen by Russia as America's direct involvement in the already deadly war. If Kamala Harris becomes our commander in chief, there will be no end in sight for the global chaos that has occurred in the Biden-Harris era. It's going to continue. And now they have us on a glide path, it seems, to a war with Russia. The war drums are beating for a significant U.S. military escalation with Russia, driven by the pro-war alliance in the media, and by the vast network of current and former military officers and deep staters who want war, war, and more war. At this point, further escalation is a risky ego play that threatens to drag us into World War III. People think about the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was obviously horrific, but that was just one of many screw-ups. They've lost control of the situation in Iran, which is now destined to become a nuclear power, thank you very much. China's threatening Taiwan and the Philippines and is supporting Russia. And of course, China has paid almost no price for any of it. Austin, Blinken, Yellen, the Three Stooges, they're still reaching out to Beijing, still hoping for a better working relationship. Sorry, guys. Beijing's just not that into you. And of course, the Middle East is exploding as Americans are still being held captive in Gaza. Biden and Harris hardly even mention that. And as all of this is unfolding, we do not have a real president or a real commander in chief. We just have Jill Biden running cabinet meetings. 
Vladimir Putin warns West he will consider using nuclear weapons. Vladimir Putin once again raised a specter he has wielded on a number of occasions since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Till now, the Russian president has considered nuclear arms to be used only in response to attacks by weapons of mass destruction or aggression that threatens the Russian state. But on Wednesday, Putin broadened his strategy up to Terence. We propose several clarifications of the conditions for using nuclear weapons. In the updated version of the document, aggression against Russia by any non-nuclear state but with the participation or support of a nuclear state is proposed to be considered as their joint attack on the Russian Federation. Putin also said an attack on Belarus would be considered a threat to Moscow. The move comes a day before Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky outlines his plan for victory hoping to convince his allies to deliver him long-range missiles capable of striking Russian territory. Putin's threats of nuclear attacks have not yet deterred Kyiv's allies from sending it arms, even as Moscow deployed nuclear weapons to Belarus in summer 2023. China firing an inter intercontinental ballistic missile into the Pacific Ocean yesterday, just hours after President Biden's last speech at the UN General Assembly, where Biden called for security in the region. You know, Maria, that's a war signal. That's the second war signal that we've gotten from China in the last 10 days, which means that Xi Jinping is about to do something truly horrendous. And we have a Biden administration that is not willing to talk to the American people about the imminence of what China is prepared to do. So, yes, we need to stop underwriting the enemy, but we also need a president to tell the American people to get ready for what could happen. Let me get your take on Russia, because Russia appears to be changing uh, its doctrine on the use of nuclear weapons to include Ukraine firing longer range Western equipped missiles deep into Russia. China appears to be fully behind this incredibly dangerous threat. I mean, is, is the U.S. going to do anything about this? The reason why Putin is making those threats was he made those threats prior to invading Ukraine and Biden backed down. And so Putin thought, well, clearly we can do more of this. And the Chinese started making threats and the North Koreans started making new threats just after the invasion of Ukraine. So Biden opened the door to this. And we have China in the most rapid nuclear buildup since the Cold War. So right now, um, our enemies are thinking of coordinating nuke attacks, uh, nuke attacks on the United States. You know, God knows we're heading into perhaps the worst moment in history. Uh, unbelievable. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Thailand legalizes same-sex marriage in a first for Southeast Asia. It's official. These two can finally get married. The Thai king signed same-sex marriage into law on Tuesday, making Thailand the first country in Southeast Asia to recognize marriage equality. Queer couples will have to wait 120 days for the law to come into effect, but from January they will be able to walk down the aisle. And judging by this rainbow display from this year's Pride March, they are sure to be colorful events.
The law also replaces terms such as men, women, husbands and wives with gender-neutral language and gives same-sex couples the same rights to adoption and inheritance as heterosexual ones. The country's former Prime Minister Sveta Tavisson, who was instrumental in the legislation, took to social media to celebrate the moment. Another important step for Thai society, the marriage equality law has been passed. Equality is tangible in Thai society. Gender diversity will finally be fully accepted. Congratulations. But the victory did not come easily. For decades, LGBTQI activists have campaigned for equal rights in the Buddhist kingdom, where many still hold conservative values. Then earlier this year, love won out when the Senate voted through the legislation 130 votes to four. Thailand now joins the growing list of more than 30 countries who have opted for the more inclusive form of marriage and is the third in Asia after Taiwan and Nepal. It is also widely recognised as one of Asia's most queer-friendly nations. We now live in an Isaiah 520 world where evil is good and good is evil, where the sin of being a homosexual or transgender is openly celebrated and even glorified. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of homosexuality that is sweeping the world today. Jesus said he would return at a time when society parallels the days of Lot, as we read in Luke 17, 28 through 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1-5 Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked them leavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16:49-50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18:22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. People keep acting as if we are living in normal times, but the truth is that these are far from normal times. We are in the midst of a perfect prophetic storm, and most people don't even realize it. While the mainstream media is endlessly focused on political drama, our world is deeply troubled by war, economic problems, famine, nightmarish pestilences, and terrifying natural disasters. What we are experiencing is not even close to normal. Every new day brings us yet another new crisis or disaster to deal with, and the pace of events is only going to escalate as this year continues. But, as bad as things are at this moment, they are about to get a whole lot worse. What we are witnessing is a glimpse of what the seven-year tribulation will be like. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37-39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. People are going to be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, just like any other day. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. I believe that time has arrived. Luke 17, 26-30 And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, he is about to send his final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. Antibiotic resistance, a problem reaching crisis levels. According to a recent study published in The Lancet, over 39 million people could die from drug-resistant infections in the next 25 years if urgent action isn't taken. And it's not just direct deaths. The study warns of an additional 169 million lives lost indirectly due to complications associated with antibiotic resistance. For perspective, by 2050, researchers say deaths associated with antibiotic resistance could increase by up to 75% from what we're seeing today. The study also highlights how low- and middle-income countries are set to bear the brunt of the crisis, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. These regions already experience the highest rates of antibiotic resistance-related deaths, driven primarily by infections like multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. The elderly are also most at risk from antimicrobials, with deaths up by 80% in the past three decades amongst over 70s. And the economic impact is equally concerning. Researchers predict that by 2030, the global economy could suffer losses of up to $3.4 trillion annually. The ripple effects of this burden could strain healthcare systems and hurt national economies, particularly in countries that can least afford it. Tonight, growing concerns about the rare mosquito-borne illness known as Triple E after a person in Ulster County actually died from it. According to the CDC, there have been at least 10 cases of eastern equine encephalitis reported nationwide this year. A few weeks ago, I was talking to some people and I started getting some bites, mosquito bites, and I got concerned. With the risk of catching a mosquito-borne illness, Upper West Side resident Ann Gorowitz says it's important to be as careful as possible. I'm going to be up in Ulster County after the weekend, and I'm going to make sure that I take precautions, long pants, long sleeve. Especially after the State Department of Health announced someone in Ulster County died from Eastern Equine Encephalitis, or Tripoli, the first human case in New York since 2015. Probably the biggest thing about it, other than the fact that it's rare, is it has a very high case fatality rate, which means people that get it have a high likelihood of dying. One of the big things that we saw this year is Eastern Equine Encephalitis being seen in many horses across many different counties. Present in 15 counties this year compared to the typical two to three, according to the health commissioner, who issued this declaration of an imminent threat to public health, which essentially gives local governments more resources for prevention, like mosquito spraying. There is currently no vaccine for Tripoli. E. The best protection, experts say, is to prevent mosquito bites. The risk for uh, Tripoli e and for West Nile virus is actually highest at this time of year because these mosquitoes have had this opportunity to pick up the virus throughout the course of summer. And while there may be fewer mosquitoes right now, they're actually more likely to be infected. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, Look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, 
in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.